Happy Halloween, everybody! This season on the Beagle Rampant Productions Gaming Profiles, we are going to be taking a look at some of the most scary and absolutely beautifully atmospheric games that perfectly fit the Halloween season. Well, okay, one of them actually doesn't really fit Halloween at all, and it really can't be called a video game, I don't think, but that's not the one we're going to be taking a look at right now. Right now, we are going to look at an interactive horror movie that has chilled me to the bone ever since I was a little kid. Yeah, it is a little weird that a little kid was able to actually see this game, but regardless, this game is one of my favorite examples of the survival horror genre, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you guys D. Yeah, that's the name of the um, video game, D. Just, you know, one letter. And it was released for the Sega Saturn, the PlayStation 1, and I am going to be looking at the Panasonic 3DO version. So I hope you guys are ready and that you are not getting ready to go to sleep or that you're not even eating anything right now because this one is a scary one. <laughs> When I mention the 3DO console, the question that you guys should immediately ask should be, oh, a uh, 3DO? What brand is it? Is it a Panasonic, a Gold Star, Sanyo, even a Sony? There were some Sony ones in the later span of the console. But unfortunately, the question that I actually get asked is, oh, the 3DO? Well, what the heck is a 3DO? Well, the 3DO was a game console designed by the 3DO company. The 3DO company released certain specifications that had to be met in order for them to produce their system. So, the 3DO company would give Panasonic, Gold Star, Sanyo, and Sony these specifications, and then they can build the machine and sell it as a 3DO. This was really good to keep development costs for the software low. That's why smaller developers like Kenji Eno, who produced the video game D that we're going to be looking at tonight, that's why he was able to go ahead and produce uh, software for this machine. Unfortunately, this plan sort of backfired because it came with a heavy, heavy consumer price tag of around $700 upon its release in 1993. As far as actual gaming consoles go, I'm playing the original Panasonic model for the 3DO. It is an interesting system, to say the least. It uses compact discs as the software, and it can also play audio CDs as well as photo CDs, which uses a graphical standard that we don't even remotely use nowadays. The interesting thing about this machine is that the controller, even though it was uh, touted as the 3DO interactive multiplayer, there is only one controller port. To get other controllers plugged in, you have to plug them in directly to the controller. Another interesting point is that we see there were only three buttons on this machine. This was the official start of the fifth generation of console video games, yet we are still very much in Sega Genesis territory. Another thing you'll notice is that the controller has a port for headphones. I've tried this, and while it does certainly create an illusion of surround sound, it definitely sounds very digital in process, so I honestly wouldn't recommend bothering with the headphone use on the controller. There is a AV expansion slot on the side here. I am not too sure what that actually did. When we look at the Panasonic 3DO, I'm not... 100% certain that this occurred in other models, we can see that there is a port to add on additional hardware. There was a planned addendum for the 3DO, at least for the Panasonic models. It was called the M2 Accelerator. The fate of the Panasonic M2 essentially went into vending machines, medical equipment, etc. in Japan, and the M2 in the United States and the rest of the world really didn't have anything of a future. 
I want to talk a little bit about the developer for this software, Kenji Aino. Kenji Aino is one of my favorite developers of all time. I loved his absolutely crazy rock and roll style of marketing and software development. The guy was absolutely crazy. Born on the 5th of May in 1970, that makes him a Taurus like me, he developed such titles for the NES as Panic Restaurant and an unreleased uh, Superman video game that was ultimately called Sunman because they lost the license to use the name Superman. But apparently it was to play very much like the NES Batman game and it sounded like a really good project, but unfortunately the plug was pulled on it. Kenjano later went on to create Warp, and Warp is famous for titles such as Tripped, a puzzle game for the 3DO, Real Sound, and the D series, which includes D, Enemy Zero, and D2. I may get a lot of sass about that in the comments section, about me lumping in Enemy Zero with the D series, but you'll find that Enemy Zero relates way more closely to D2 than the game we're going to be looking at tonight, which is D. As I mentioned earlier, the video game D was released for the Sega Saturn, the 3DO, and the Sony PlayStation. The Sony PlayStation version is actually quite a bit more extended than the one that I'm going to be looking at tonight, but we should not fall into the trap of thinking that Kenji Aino had a special relationship with Sony, or I should say his special relationship with Sony was one of hatred and animosity. Sony did not deliver the promised amount of pre-orders for this game, which ultimately ended up hurting Warp Inc. very, very badly. Kenji Aino reacted to the slight by jumping on a plushie of Robit, the mascot for the hit PlayStation game Jumping Flash. He jumped on a plushie of Robit, and then, to add insult to this little injury, he announced that his next title, Enemy Zero, was going to be a Sega Saturn exclusive, and he was going to be a sole developer for Sega from that point. This, of course, infuriated Sony, and one could definitely think, oh, this is a crazy move to do, but he had his relationship with Sega very well lined up, and granted, Sony did not actually rule the world and was not as nightmarishly horrifying as it is today, so this seemed like a good enough idea to do at the time. After the release of D2 on the Sega Dreamcast in the year 2000, Warp was going through quite a bit of uh, financial difficulties. They later rebranded as Super Warp, but eventually they had to disband. Kenji Aino later went on to find the internet development company from yellow to orange, and he would work for that company until his untimely death at the young age of 43 in 2013. So now we're finally going to take a look at the actual video game D. It's helpful to think of D more as an interactive horror movie as opposed to an actual video game. There is no saving and you have a two hour time limit to complete the game. And of course, if you are like me and you played through it before, the two hour time limit is way more than you'll ever actually need and nowadays we have the internet and walkthroughs so two hours is certainly more than generous to complete this game. In the introduction movie, we see a man, Dr. Richter Harris, committing a mass murder in his hospital in Los Angeles. His daughter, Laura, who is a student in San Francisco, hears about the tragedy and gets in her car and starts driving down to the hospital in Los Angeles. And I'm glad this isn't an urgent situation because they're going to have a bit of a wait at that hospital for her to get there. When Laura enters the hospital, it is transformed into a castle. When we talk about the gameplay of D, it helps to think of this not so much as a game like Mario or Metroid where you are moving a character across the screen, but rather you are actually playing a series of movie clips when you press either up, down, left, right, or back. It is a little bit to get used to, but that's why she can't necessarily move from one place to another in the most direct way. You have to play each individual movie file when she is at rest. Another thing you'll notice is a little compact mirror, which is used to give you hints and helpful suggestions if you're stuck on a puzzle. We used this quite a bit back in the 1990s, but nowadays with the internet, eh, we don't really use it so much. 
When you first walk in and walk backwards, you'll notice that there's a little scarab. In the 3DO version, there are four scarabs that reflect a memory Laura has, and apparently this memory involves eating. Hmm. We'll learn a little bit more about that later. Before we jump into the gameplay, Laura's father materializes as sort of a secret world of Alex Mack kind of thing, and we are in a world that is created in his own mind. This is another world born of my own mind. We are obviously walking through the memories and psyche of a very disturbed and very violent man, but this man is Laura's father and she is committed to saving him. Throughout much of Disc 1, you're basically exploring something of a normal-ish house and, oh my gosh, it's a corpse. Ooh, yeah. This game was supposed to receive an M rating for Mature, but Kenji Aino decided to switch out his clean and edited version with his original bloody, gory, violent one, and the ESRB did not have enough time to change the software rating, so technically we're playing a very much M rated game with a T label stamped on it. Typically, if Laura is able to walk towards an object, there is something significant about that object. There is no such thing as an empty object that she's just going to stare at vacantly. If you are able to look at it or interact with it, there is something you have to do with it. If you can't interact with it straight away, look around in some other locations. You may need an item to actually set the events into motion. Most of the puzzles are pretty self-explanatory in this game, but there are a few that are just downright sadistic, and there are many more that are really just there to sort of eat up your two-hour time limit. Like this stupid slot machine puzzle! Oh my gosh, you slot machine puzzle! I hate you! I am never going to Vegas! Well, actually, I've been to Vegas, but, you know, as a little kid. Right around when this game was released, believe it or not. Because Vegas is a family town. But this stupid slot machine puzzle! You see the number 78 early on in the game, so you figure, okay, this is the number that I have to use. But, you can't actually hit 7, 8. No, that would be too easy. You have to actually hit 8, because it rolls back 1 on the left side, and get this. For the second number, it rolls back 8 spaces. <sighs> This gave me so much frustration as a kid back in the 90s, and it still gives me quite a bit of frustration to this day. And I played through this game on multiple occasions, and I still can just never seem to perfectly knack it. You'll eventually end up in an area that looks like it leads towards a cellar. So, you go down towards the cellar to progress, and oh my god, a boulder's chasing Laura. And I have got to give Laura props for running in those weird shoes that are kind of like heels, but not really. They make the clicky heel sound, but they really look more like flats. I got to give her props for running away from a frickin' boulder in those sorts of monster shoes. I mean, I wouldn't do it, and I'm just saying I am glad I am a guy and I am not expected by society to wear such monsters. So eventually, Laura is trapped in her little castle hospital dungeon thing by this gigantic boulder. And to add insult to injury, Laura's father comes back and says, Go back. Now. You must turn back. Um, dude, didn't you notice the gigantic boulder blocking my way? And I would have to be like the Incredible Hulk or something if I wanted a remote shot of moving that thing. In this area, we find some more pretty self-explanatory puzzles, and we see this scene that I find just absolutely hilarious, where Laura has to wrestle a key out of a corpse's hand. You know, I wonder if I should see a special kind of talking doctor. <laughs> nah, it's fine. Look at her wrestle that corpse. That's good stuff. Once we find a book and place it on the shelf, we head up the stairs and... Wow! <laughs> oh, God! Oh... Oh, it's time for disc two. Apparently my Panasonic 3DO likes to spit out a disc when it's um, completed with it, so... Yeah, I don't know if 3DOs are actually supposed to do that, or if that's just a glitch of mine, but that's my reality here. While I do absolutely love this game, and I think that its gameplay is very unique and very well executed, 
Disc 2 involves this annoying rotating room, which really to me feels like it's just here to eat up your time limit, and there's not a lot of content on Disc 2. Basically, your goal on Disc 2 is to break through this stained glass window. You break through the stained glass window by grabbing a pistol from a treasure chest, but oh look, the treasure chest is in a spike well. To get rid of the spike well, you have to go and press the correct buttons on this fountain that match up with the zodiac signs of Sagittarius and Aquarius. But if you need a hint to find out where that is, you have to run into the armory and do a quick time event battle with this night creature. And I have to say, the quick time event is very well executed for this game, something that I honestly wasn't expecting. Now granted, I mess up quite a bit on this because I accidentally thought there was a scarab down there that I wanted to find, but there actually wasn't, and then I just couldn't get my mojo back. You know how it is, but... This is a very well done quick time event. The problems you see here are with the player. But before we start on this crazy merry-go-round of getting into all of these crazy rooms, our father comes back and mentions that he feels like he is losing his control. Which is interesting. You didn't feel like you were losing your control when you shot all of those people in the hospital? You had everything together then, man? Yeesh. Once we finally get the pistol and blast away at the stained glass window, Laura climbs up a tower, and this is where the climax of the game occurs. As Laura moves about the top of the tower, her father pops in and mentions that their family is actually descendant of Dracula. Now, if you want to know if that's actually a thing that could happen, I suggest you click that little subscribe button because coming up on this channel, you will see my travel profile of Romania. If you keep moving at the top of the tower, you'll find the final scarab, and the memory that the final scarab reveals is Laura eating an arm. Oh. Laura, that... that's disgusting. I mean, if you were hungry, I could have given you the phone number to Papa John's or something. I mean, there's no need to... eat people. Halfway through the room, there's a secret door that leads to one of the most annoying puzzles in the whole game, the stupid cog puzzle. And even with the walkthrough in front of me, I cannot find out how to actually complete this puzzle. I just sort of slam all the buttons and levers and hope it matches up somehow, and it always seems to, so that's good. Once you get past this annoying cog puzzle, you'll come to the final confrontation with your father. He mentions that Dracula is calling to the family, and that they must give in to their insane and dark temptations, and that's why Laura killed her mother? The, the woman that she was eating was her mother. Yes, there is such a thing as a video game with a T rating where you cannibalize your own mother. Yeah, that is a serious thing that has happened. Her father offers her a choice. She could either join him and become this weird, disgusting looking meat vampire, or she can go ahead and blast him away and be free of the curse. If you want the good ending of this video game, you have to be the good daughter and go ahead and shoot your pappy. And uh, once you shoot your poppy, he thanks you for letting him die like a real mortal man. The two share a loving moment together, even though it is her father's last. As Richter Harris dies, he is able to look at his daughter Laura as a man and a proud father, as opposed to a dark and hideous monster. And then we see this awesome credit song! If you're able to collect all of the scarabs, you'll hear a baby crying at the end of the credits. This is the best ending you can go ahead and get. The crying baby was actually going to be the protagonist of D2, but unfortunately, since the M2 project was cancelled, D2 itself was completely reworked to the point of it's really more of a sequel to Enemy Zero than it is to 
this actual game here. So when Kenji Eno puts this really polite note at the end of his game saying thank you for playing and watch out for our next game, he's actually not referring to D2. He's technically referring to Enemy Zero. And the actual D2 game will feel a lot more like Enemy Zero, but that's actually a different video for next Halloween because, you know, time limits and my laziness. Never underestimate the power of my laziness. But that's D for the Panasonic 3DO, Sega Saturn, and Sony PlayStation. But if you were a good Warp and Kenji Eno fan, you would not be playing this on a PlayStation. D is such an amazing and atmospheric experience. It can literally chill one to the bone, even to this day. The music is absolutely spot on, the puzzles work really well, and the controls are absolutely solid, believe it or not, for a game that works as a series of movies, and for a game that's as old as it is. This game does live up very well nowadays, but it certainly needs a modern facelift. Have any of you guys ever played D for any of the machines? Are there some differences between the PlayStation version? I actually broke our PlayStation. We originally had it on the PlayStation, but I broke it because I wanted it to load faster, and we instead bought this on the 3DO. But have any of you guys ever played any of the versions of D? And did I miss something pretty important here in this video? Let me know down in the comments section below. I love hearing from you guys. I have some of the best fans in the entire world, and I really appreciate all of your support and everything you guys do for me. And uh, I'm happy to get in front of the camera and make a bit of a buffoon of myself for you guys. You guys are really great, and I really do appreciate your patronage and your loyalty. So thank you guys once again for watching. Thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing. I really need some subscribers, so don't be shy. Click that little subscribe button. It won't bite you. I mean, you just saw a video about a video game where a woman cannibalizes her mother. Clicking a subscribe button is not the scariest thing that's going to happen to you tonight. I'm Jordan Rolfus. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on the Beagle Rampant Productions Gaming Profiles.